and now it's ready. So as uh, Chelsea said, well, I will be talking about this uh, this research that I I continue doing and I did also for my postdoctoral my postdoc that is called well phylogenetic relationships and evolution of the pisaloid. I have been working with uh, Gloria Barbosa and Stacy Smith on this uh, research topic. Um, well, as a, a short introduction about the SNAC family that you already know. Well, this family, you know, is a medium-sized one that comprises about 100 genera and almost 300 species. And half of these species are included. Let me change my. Okay, I included in all these big genus that is highlighted in green, that is Solanum. Um, this family also encompasses a lot of economically important species, as the tomato, potato, and also for sure, for, for sure the chili peppers. Um, but anyway, the focus of our seminars is the Fisalia tribe, this group, that for me is very interesting because most of the fisaloids are placed in this tribe. So when we are talking about fisaloids, where Maggie Whitson and Manos were the ones that started with the term, I think, um, they refer to fisaloids as those genera morphologically reminiscent of fisalis, due to a presence of some amount of calyx expansion. But when we are talking about inflated calyx, the first thing that comes up in our mind is the famous tomatillo and relatives. But actually, there is a huge amount of other genera and even plant families with very similar structures, as I will show you here. And there are numerous variations of a crescent and inflated calyx. You can see here that there are different genera with these structures, and at least 11 families and seven order of angiosperms that are highlighted with these red arrows here. So this is a clear example of phenotypic conversions and how um, fruits of all these species that are not closely related come to look very similar. So this happens uh, in several families and orders within uh, the angiosperms, but even within Solanaceae, there are 19 genera that show the inflated calyx syndrome, or at least some kind of a crescent calyx that surrounds entirely the fruit. This was indicated at least 20 independent origins for this trait, which is found in several species of this giant genus Solanum, and also for the tribe Iosiame, but most of the species with inflated calyx are within the Fisalide tribe. So, but why, what is this fruit in calyx? Well, here we have a picture of how this happens in nature. This is a Deprea species that I studied during my PhD. Um, you can see here how this calyx grows more and more to entirely cover the fruit. Here in this picture, I cut the calyx so, the calyx so we can see how the berry is entirely enclosed in entirely enclosed by the calyx, and there is also a space between this calyx and the berry. So something interesting here is, which is the function in, of this persistent crescent and inflated calyx? So there are several hypotheses about the function of this trait. For example, in the endemic Tibetan genus Prewalskia, the units of the inflated calyx plus this dry fruit is a capsule, acts as a tumbleweed, scattering the seeds as it blows. Other species have a colorful calyx like this, like in Genji or some sp own species of Eochroma, Eochroma calicinum. So the function could be advertisement to promote the dispersion of these fruits. But by the other hand, it's very well known that the calyx has a protective function on the buds and this could continue in the fruit, avoiding the fruit being eaten before it's mature. And about that, 
where there is a lot of evidence now that the calyx provide a humid environment for the development of the berry, helping in dry environments like where most of the physalists live. There is also a flotation uh, hypothesis because the air that is, uh, it remains between the berry and the calyx can also make the berry float and, can, uh, this, and it could be dispersed by water. So at the end, the function is not entirely clear, but maybe it has all this function and all the researchers agree that this trait is advantageous. So our work there was mostly restricted to the Pisalia tribe. So something interesting is that uh, how is the development of this fruit in calyx? So there is some, there is some evidence that citokinins and giverlins are required along with a terotopic expression of a transcriptome factor that is called MPF2 in the calyx to be uh, made this in plated calyx. So the first problem in trying to infer the evolutionary history of these traits in this group was the low and uneven sampling plus the low resolution in previous phylogenetic studies. So in this research that we are seeing here, they included just a few genera of the Fisalia tribe, and you can see this big polytomy within Fisali. In this tree, the black branches denote the species that don't express the MPF2-like sheen, and neither have an inflated calyx like Brunalia and Eoproma. By the other hand, the branches that lead into species that express the MPF2 gene in the calyx are shown in orange and in green. And in green indicates, indicates only the species that display this inflation in the calyx. So as you can see, it seems like all the different, all the different species included here, except these two, have this expression on the MPF2 gene in the calyx. Um, for this reason, this author suggested that inflated calyx represents the ancestral state and probably has been, has been lost several times. However, they only included 10% of the species of the tribe, and we needed more to more sampling and more information to know if this was the situation for this trait. So there are, well, we focus on our study in the Fisalia tribe, and this tribe includes 29 genera and almost 300 species. And something very interesting is that within these 29 genera, 13 have an inflated calyx and 7 present a partial or total aggressance of the calyx. And something curious about this group is shown in this graphic, which represents the numbers of the species per genera, showing in red the proportion of the, of the species with an inflated calyx. And in blue is represented the aggression at present, the, sorry, the aggression at present calyx in the species that have this trait. And in black are the species that, doesn't, that don't have an aggression calyx. As you can see here, the two genera with more species are Physalis and the Prea, and the first one with all inflated, uh, all, this, all the species with inflated calyx, while, whereas the Prea has more than a half of the species also with calyx inflation. So with all this background in mind, I propose to study the evolutionary history of inflated calyx within the tribe, first increasing the sampling and molecular data to resolve phylogenetic relationships, and then tracing the evolution of this peculiar trait, the inflated calyx. So for this, in the first place, we increased the samples, including 231 species, of so almost 300 species of, uh, that are included in the tribe. And this represents the 77% of the tribe diversity. 
So the samples were obtained from fieldwork, herbaria, and also a lot of collaboration with other researchers, some of you that are here in the seminar. And um, something very important is that um, here is that we were very careful about including a representative sample of the three states of the fruiting calyx, which are with the different colors here, meaning the red, the inflated calyx during the entire presentation, and also in blue, the aggressive and oppressing calyx, and black, the non aggressive one. So, we sequenced four DNA regions to perform the phylogenetic reconstructions with maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference. So, this is the consensus tree of the maximum likelihood analysis with the combined data set with the four markers. And um, we keep 220 taxa plus the three outgroups after pruning the rock taxa. Here, different colors are showing major groups, such as red is indicating the red is indicating the prea, and green is indicating the non-monophyletic physalis. Blue, for example, is the subtribe hyogromina whereas the light blue is the, uh, the monophyletic Aureliana that now is called Atenea. So this phylogeny with a better resolution not only allow us to infer the evolution of the fruiting calyx, but also pointed to several taxonomical problems within the group. Here, you can see uh, the major clades that we resolve in this phylogeny. So here is showing how iogromine is resolved as sister to a clade including the rest of Pisalidae. Within this clade, there are two well-supported clades. The first one, including the Prea, Aureliana, part of Quitania, and Quadresia, and the second clade, including all the Pisalidine subtribe plus some genera of the Witanine, like Viscopodium, Tudocapsicum, Archifisalis, and also part of Witania. So, we found out that eight genera resolve as non-monophyletic, and we think that this happened because, mainly because several um, homoplastic characters have been used to perform the generic circumscription, for example, the inflation of the calyx. So a situation to highlight here is the one of Witania. Because this genus is well known because Witania somnifera, this one, that is highly used in medicine. So this old world genus is not monophyletic. It resolved into two major clades, as you can see here in red. One, closely, one of the clades is closely related to the genera also from the old world, like Tugocapsicum, Discopodium, and Archifisalis. Whereas the other clade that encompasses Witania Aristata and Witania Frutescens um, is closely related to Atenea, uh, Aurelian, that now is called Atenea, which is mostly restricted to Brazil. So something very interesting here is that Hepper, in his morphological and taxonomic work, he already said that these two species, Britannia aristata and Britannia protestants, were unlike others in the genus, and that we should look across the Atlantic to find their ancestors, where Atenea is. So after almost 30 years, we confirm this with molecular data. But Something, the, the problem here was that Britannia frutescens is the type of Britannia, the conserved type of Britannia, but the most widely used and important name here is Britannia somnifera, that is in this other place. So we don't want to lose the name of Britannia for this species. And this is why Gloria and me and I proposed to change the conserved type of Witania to Witania somnifera, so we can also keep the name Witania for at least these three species. So after we resolved the phylogenetic relationships, 
we started codifying the fruiting calyx of all the species samples. So we codify three states of this character. When we are talking about calyx accrescence or accrescent abreast, this was defined as an increase in the calyx length of 50% of more from flower to fruit stage. And for inflated calyx, we call the one that the aggressions of the calyx after, after antesis, antesis is such an extent that the fruit is entirely enclosed, um, but there is also a space between the calyx and the berry. So after we have, uh, we have scored all the species, we apply the Bayesian, Bayesian stochastic mapping to address different questions like, if all these routes are possible, or are some of them directional or not? So we first, uh, with all the scoring ready, we first test the evolutionary model. Um, we tested if your, our data fitted better with a model where all the rates are different, like this one, or, for example, if it, it fits better with a stepwise model, reversible, totally reversible, or with some step irreversible like these ones. So we found out that the best model was the third one, a step-wise and irrever irreversible in the step from an aggressive calyx to a non-aggressive uh, calyx. This indicates that the evolution of the protein calyx is directional to an inflated calyx which contradicts the previous hypothesis, the one that I was talking at the beginning, that the inflated calyx is easier to be lost than to be gained. So the shifts in character states were estimated with Bayesian stochastic mapping, as it is shown here. And across the clade, we estimated 50 changes. And the ancestor of the tribe was estimated as uh, with a non-aggressive calyx, but we also found a strong phylogenetic signal for these traits. For example, all the Physalis species, all these clay, the Physalis of genus Rydbergis, have inflated calyxes. So these very frequent and directional transitions toward inflation suggest not only that the trait is generally accessible, but also that inflation is generally retained by lineages in which it evolves. The retention of the inflation of the calyx following its evolution may also reflect not only selective advantages, but also developmental constraints acting on reversal. For example, some ablation experiments in Fisalis and Britannia reveal a complex crosstalk between the calyx and the fruit development at early stages, wherein removal of, of cepas prior to fertilization completely abolishes fruit cycling. So here's a summary. You can see how this calyx follows a stepwise evolution from non-aggressant to aggressant press, uh, from non-aggressant press to inflated with 24 changes to an aggressive press calyx and also 24 more uh, shifts to an inflated calyx with only two reversals. So this frequent evolutionary shift in calyx morphology and the repeated origins of inflated calyxes in physiology provide a strong foundation for future studies testing the influence of this trait on diversification rates. So this is the next step, estimate the diversification rates. But to do that, first, we need to know the diversion signs for, for the family. So we need new age estimates, because you can see here the phylogeny of all the family. And there are new fossils that have been discovered in South Argentina by Peter Wills and collaborators. And these ones contradicts previous divergence time estimated. So these previous estimates uh, made by the Silva collaborators and also Tina Serkinen and a big group of researchers, they used, the, they used fossil seeds to, they applied an calibration using these fossil seeds for the ancestor of the family 
which is marked with an A, and the subfamily Solanoidae, which is marked with a B. But the new fruit fossils recently discovered that is this one and others also. Well, they have a, they are 52 million years old and have been placed, suggesting to be placed in the sub tritisalidine of the salidae, a group which age was estimated as 20 million years old. So in synthesis, these fossils, these new fossils of more than 50 million years are proposed to be placed in a group with less than the half of this age. So that's why right now I'm starting this new project, actually started uh, like very, several months ago, and scoring more taxa and trying to uh, estimate this new time calibrated phylogeny for the family, including all the available um, fossil evidence for the family. So for this project, uh, we have three main goals. The first one is to construct a morphological data set for all the fossilized seeds and fruits and uh, using micro CT techniques and also electronic microscope analysis here at uh, the Natural History Museum. And also the second step is to create a matching data set for the stand species that are included, are included in the existing molecular phylogenies. So we are advancing in these two first steps now. And the third goal is to apply model-based methods to strongly estimate the placement of the fossils and also the diversion times for the solanacea. So, well, this is, um, this is a huge project with a lot of collaborators that we are working uh, very nicely all together. Um, and well, this is the goal to have this calibrated phylogeny in two years, I hope. So finally, I would like to thank to all the people most that are in this group that help to, to accomplish these goals, to, to have some samples or DNA for the species that were included in this uh, fissality phylogeny. And of course, to all institutions and all the people, the staff of the Herbarium, all who help with funding or other resources to, to continue this research. Um, thank you all of you for listening and to participate in, in this meeting in this group. Okay, so now we're moving into the discussion period. So if you have questions, you can uh, type them or you can turn on your mic and ask the questions for Rocio. Um, great talk, Rocio. It was a really great introduction uh, to start us off. Thank you. I know if someone has questions. It's great that from now on we will be focusing, well, starting my and next presentation with uh, Fisalis at its a huge group <laughs> to work on, um, well, on the research. Uh, so I'm also like interested, I'm always like, kind of interested in this transition and maybe you can talk about like what your hypothesis is, is like why is there only one, like two reversals back to a crescent and why it never reverses all the way back? Do you think it's just like it's stuck in this dispersal area or uh, what do you think is going on with that? Or do you think it's like genetics with this um, MPF2 gene being expressed, not expressed kind of thing? Or well, I, I think that um, while there is some constraints in the development of these protein Gaelic that um, these constraints uh, doesn't, don't allow to go back to the previous state, but um, these um, has to do with this cross talk between the development of the fruit with the calyx, because that's why when you ablate the calyx, sometimes uh, 
well, the, um, the fruit is not well developed. But anyway, there is some selective advantages that uh, are acquired with the fruit in Gaelic. And uh, I think that that's a very strong reason to to not come back to a previous state, like the, the aggressive press or never to uh, non aggressive Gaelic. I would like to see if someone is interested to perform a similar study in other of the families where this appears, like uh, other of the 11 families within Irish sperms. Um, that would be very interesting. Um, I don't know if he's, someone has a question or I think that some of you have already seen part of these presentations in an um, AC meeting, probably like in the rest. <laughs> um, and something interesting here also is about, well, the taxonomy. We are trying to fix uh, Iogramina that currently has seven genera, but we are just uh, like re rearranging the generic circumscription to just three genera. So we'll see. We have identified very good characters to separate these three genera, so we, we are working on that and we'll see how it goes and how we can put together a good key for this. Uh, Dietra, do you have a question? You can uh, always unmute your mic and ask questions. So, it seems that there is no questions. <laughs> Okay, here yeah. you can ask here. <laughs> That's why. Um, you can, so another thing you kind of showed during your presentation is a little hint of biogeography. Do you think that's something that you'll oh try to do a little bit more with or um, how much do you think that influences the tribe? Because it's mostly South American, but there's a lot of dispersals elsewhere and... Yeah, actually... Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, I have some biogeographic analysis that I didn't include, sorry. But um, yes, it's very interesting because within this tribe, you know that there is some long time, long, uh, uh, well, they are dispersed to long distance, so to Asia and also to Africa for the Witania. So with this, uh, with this split of Witania into two clays, we have more dispersals here also. And of course, that the ancestor of the tribe, as it is in Solanaceae, is from South America, but it has been several disper long distance dispersals to another continent. Um, this is something very interesting for this group. How do you think that affects inflated calyx? Because it seems like a lot of their, the inflated calyx have diversified on different continents, like Dupre is in South America, Physilis is majority North America. You have some, the Physilis australium 
in Asia? And do you think it's just like because there was that niche, this inflated calyx could diversify in those areas? I think so. It could be a good hypothesis. But yes, I, I would like to test how it influenced the breathing calyx, the, the dispersal to different environments. Because, for example, the ones that are in Asia, like Fisaliastrum, um, yes, Fisaliastrum and Archifisalis, they have an inflated or a pressed calyx to the fruit. And also, well, we will know how how worldwide is distributed the, the fissalis, although they're native from South America, but they're present almost everywhere. And also they have this inflated calyx. So something, but anyway, there are several monotypic genera like Discopodium, for example, yeah. And Tugocapsicum, like they are in Asia and they have a non aggressive calyx. So it's something to test. It will be very exciting to know what's going on with dispersal sound inflation. So I can read the question of Deidre. So for inflated versus aggression, how does something like Fisalis pubescens versus Fisalis philadelphica fit in? Where it's fully encased and has space between berry and the husk in the other the very outgrowth, the husk is exposed in the production of pistolis were listed as inflated. Yeah, like in usually like the species that are cultivated, like are well, there is some artificial selections and that's how the fruit is it grows much more and the calyx is suppressed in those cases. But um, for the for the like the, the wild species of chrysalis, all the species have this space, at least a minimum space between the calyx and the fruit. And the other question is, oh, from Peter. I don't know if I answered the question of Daedra. Oh, in the phylogeny of chrysalis were listed as inflated. Yes. So yes, um, all the chrysalis in the phylogeny were listed as inflated in that case. Um, the other question is from Peter. The fossils are from the southern South American part of Gondwana, South America, Antarctica, and Australia. There was no distance in South America when the family evolved, which must have been much earlier. Yes, that's something that it will be amazing. Like, yes, if all the Southern Asia evolved much earlier than it has been proposed up to now. So they were all this part all work on one, so they were all together and the long dispersal events were not so long dispersal. They were like the distance are much shorter, I think. <laughs> so we will see when we have the new dates. But yes, that's probably what will happen. Thank you. So I don't know if you have any other questions or you want to discuss something. Okay, I'm just typing. I was wondering about the other Whitney species. I understand there are around 20. Actually not 20, it's 11, but yes. Do you have plans to start to work on both clades? Do you know some morphological difference between Britannia's belonging to the two groups? Well, yes. Um, I don't have a samples for the other species. I only have sequenced Melissia bimonifolia, that's the only monotypic genus that is not included in the phylogeny. To know to which one of the clades is more closely related, because it's supposed to be more closely related to the Britannia somnifera clade. And I, I would like to, to sample more species and to know what's going on with the other ones. But um, I have noticed the morphological differences between the, the two groups. Like the two Wittania Aristata and Protestants have very like 
Laciniate lots of the cane leaks, and there are other differences in the androesium. So um, they are very different to the other group of quitanias. And it seems like morphologically that all the other not sample quitanias will be more closely related to the Witania somifer clay. But we will have to to study them to know for sure. <laughs> Are welcome. I think in this part of the discussion, if you agree, we can turn on the microphone and speak directly. <laughs> so it's less boring, <laughs> sorry. Oof. Well, it seems like it provides protection. Well, sorry, I will read the question. So what's known about the calyx providing protection against is insect predation, that is from choice. So there is some hypothesis that it protects before the, the, the fruit is mature. But actually, we have seen in the field with Chelsea that a lot of fruits are attacked anyway by different, I think it's some butterfly larvae or something. Probably Chelsea will remember this better. You can turn on the microphone, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I've been wondering because sometimes what I read is they, they hypothesize that the <clears throat> calyx developed because it gave some sort of fitness against insect predation. Um, we see a little bit of difference in goldenberry versus ground cherry um, where we, you know, I don't know so much. Again, it's this Heliothus subflexa. Um, and maybe that's the larvae that you saw. If there's, um, again, some sort of thought that maybe there was insect pressure that gave a fitness to the um, species that had this calyx. Yeah, I think there is some, yes, it's a, it affects the fitness probably, but for some of the, it depends on the species that I haven't, I haven't studied a lot of the cultivated ones, but in the field, the Pisalis fenulari, for example, was one of that we found most of the fruit uh, all infected with this kind of larvae. And there was just, I think, over 100, only two or three that were mature and um, like ready to, to be eaten, but all the other were infected and all desiccated. So I'm not sure how much protection could um, who provide these fruiting Gaelic, so. And I don't know if you noticed this, Joyce, but it's like, it, it was interesting because the caterpillars would just make a little hole or the larvae would just make a little hole on top of the calyx. And then like sit inside the calyx is almost like their protection as well as they ate the fruit, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, interesting. yeah, I came across a paper that um, said that they believe that there's with the with analytes give some sort of protection um, from a bacteria that um, affects the heliothus subflexal larvae um, okay. and that they do somehow make their way through the calyx to be able to you know um, be on the fruit so yeah and, and that probably happens at the early stages um, of development um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Dietra is going to present later this semester, but uh, her PhD, she did some plant defenses, so maybe she can talk more about that. Great, excellent. Thank you. And something very interesting here is that all the species that have very, very inflated calyx and also the cultivated one have this in the inside side, side of the calyx, they have these glandular hairs that have this substance that is kind of sticky. And I don't know which is the exact function of these hairs or what makes them the sticky, berry to, I don't know if it, it, has, if it has something to do with the rotation, uh, the rotation function or it's something about 
protection of the fruit and to their or beavers or insects. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, thinking about dispersal, so this is something I've learned recently, and I don't know if other people know about this, but it's like, um, I, I've so it was fish dispersal. So it's this idea is like fruits will float or whatever, and fish will eat it, especially like in the Amazons when things get flooded, and then it will the water retract, and so they're dispersing during this time where things are inflated. And I think that'd be an interesting hypothesis. I was just wondering if anybody's ever heard of that before or have an, an idea of like what else could be going on with that. Yeah, that's something very interesting because you know that when 52 million years ago, the, all that part where the fossil was found was floated. So probably flotation and also fish dispersion could be could have a very important role on the dispersion and fitness of these species. So I would like to see if, uh, well, after we have the date, how, how we can explain the, the first functions of this particular trait that can then could be different. Like right now it could be mostly protective, but back then probably the function was that. Well, I don't know if you have any other questions or I think we can finish the, the seminar. And just to remember everyone, like this Monday, we have the, this special seminar that Sandy will be presenting um, a talk for her introduction to the National Academy of Science from Argentina. So this is this will be recording and transmitted through this this uh, network to sign up, of course, you know. <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much, Rocio, for kicking this off. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, there's. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that there was another question. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone, to to come uh, to this seminar. And okay, and, and see you on Monday, right? <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>